I send out a, a list of about 10 themes before I go and conduct a gospel meeting and then ask the elders or men of the congregation if they have a theme they'd like to choose from that list to let me know. And I know this theme is timely in more than one place because it just seems like this is the theme that's being selected more often than any of the other uh, nine uh, themes that are on that list. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I was preaching on this very theme at Bay, Arkansas a few months ago. And uh, then, Lord willing, this Thursday, I'll fly to Houston, Texas to do a Thursday through Sunday meeting. They wanted this, this subject, God's answers to men's questions about the end of time. There's a whole lot of misinformation that's being promoted out there about the end of time and what's coming and what's not coming. If you're familiar at all with the Left Behind series of novels, which have uh, numbered in the tens of millions in sales, and uh, then you think about some of the movies that ha they have made uh, based on these novels, which are written like novels, and yet they are pr propagating a whole bunch of error. I teach an entire quarter on this subject at the School of Preaching, and so uh, I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch this week of what this doctrine is all about. And I'm going to do so by taking questions that men have asked and giving you God's answers to those questions rather than giving you man's answers. And I want to point out something to you as we begin. I know I'm going to be going through these charts much faster than anyone could possibly write down. And so uh, all of these charts that are presented this week, I will make available to you for free uh, through uh, some means uh, either by email or I can send them to the church here and uh, they can get you a copy of them if you'd like to get one, uh, then that would be fine. Let me acquaint you with what we're talking about when we discuss this matter of premillennialism by giving you a little timeline. And I, I want to go back and notice something here with you. Israel, you'll notice on the far side of the chart here, we have the word Israel. Israel is what premillennialism is all about because in their faulty view, God still owes Israel some land that they never did get and that God is going to finally give it to them at the end of time when Jesus Christ comes back to reign in Jerusalem for 1,000 years on this planet. That is the basic big picture doctrine of premillennialism. And so they say that Jesus came to engage in his personal ministry, and a growing number of the premillennialists are those who would argue that he originally came with the intent of setting up an earthly kingdom then, but that he was unexpectedly rejected by the Jews, and so the Father and Christ had to call an audible at the line of scrimmage, so to speak. They had to come up with some other plan, plan B, if you will. And that's when the church came into their consciousness. They said, well, we can't set the earthly kingdom up we plan to set up. And so what are we going to do in the meantime? Well, let's set up the church age. You'll come back to heaven. We'll let the church age rock along for a while. And then we'll send you back to earth and you can set up the kingdom next time. Now, your question is probably the same one that I have had and that many of others have had over the years. If Jesus really meant to set up a kingdom the first time he came and he couldn't get it done because man unexpectedly rejected him, what's to keep him from being unexpectedly rejected the next time? Is he going to have to go back to heaven again in a failure the second time after he couldn't get the kingdom set up. It's really a rather blasphemous doctrine because it suggests that Jesus couldn't get done what he came to do. <clears throat> but the problem with the allegation is he never came to set up an earthly kingdom as they so claimed. And so the church age was established as an alternate to this. Now here's what they believe is going to happen. And we're going to talk about this during the worship hour in more detail, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. At a certain time, and uh, some would tell you it's going to be very soon based on the so-called signs, and we'll be talking about that tonight at the afternoon service. 
Some would tell you that uh, here's the situation. Someday, very soon, there are going to be all kinds of people just vanish from this planet. Believers are going to be raptured out of here. And the only folks that are left behind that aren't raptured out of here are the wicked. And that they will then have an opportunity perhaps during seven years of tribulation on earth to uh, get their ship in the right direction and start steering it in the right direction. And that uh, then at the end of this rapture period, or I should say this tribulation period of some would say three and a half years in length, some would say seven years in length, uh, that the, they're going to come back with Christ and that's when the battle of Armageddon will be fought. And that's when Christ will uh, give the Jews the land that they've always uh, been waiting for. And Satan will be bound and the kingdom will be established. And it will last for 1,000 years. And then at the end of that 1,000 year period, that's when eternity in heaven or in hell will begin. That is the basic premillennial timeline. Now, let me show you something about the church and the nation of Israel that is believed. They believe Israel was selected by God uh, to receive certain benefits. And it's true, Israel was selected by God to be the nation through whom the Messiah would come and through whom the kingdom would be established. But here's what uh, they believe that's not true. They believe that the church is simply a parenthesis. It's a... Uh, it's never been the full focus of what God wanted to do, even though Ephesians chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 make it clear that the church was in the eternal purpose of God. It was never God's intention for the church to be plan B. It's always been plan A. And the church was indeed established by design, not by emergency measure. It was always God's plan. They say that at the end of the church age, there'll be the second coming uh, of Christ in rapture form. And they'll uh, then after a thousand years on earth, Israel will be accepted during that time period. Now, these charts, I know the lettering on some of them may not be as easy to read in the back. And so I'll make sure that I read some of the uh, quotations so that you can get the flavor of what's being said I'm reading to you a statement that is commonly made among those who are in the religious world, and it is this, quote, it was after the rejection of Matthew 12, 23 and 24, that the Lord first makes a prophecy of the coming church in Matthew 16. Now, I've underlined this next statement. This is what they believe. The church is manifestly an interruption of God's program for Israel, which was not brought into being until Israel's rejection of the offer of the kingdom. In other words, the church was never even dreamed of in the mind of God until Israel rejected the a kingdom that Christ came to bring or that uh, Jesus was rejected by the Israelites and so the kingdom was not established on earth as he intended. Uh, John Walvoord, who is a prominent premillennialist who worked with the Dallas Theological Seminary and they have they propagated more premillennialism into this world than just about anyone on the planet. Walvoord says the present age that we're in now, we're in a parenthesis. It is a time period, now watch this part, not predicted by the Old Testament, and therefore what's happening now is not fulfilling or advancing the program of events revealed in the Old Testament for view. They claim the Old Testament prophets never even thought of the church, never even anticipated the church. It was never in their mind. It was always in their mind that Christ would set up an earthly kingdom and that the church is not that kingdom. That's what they believe. Now, does the Old Testament ever refer to the church? John Walford says no. Hal Lindsey wrote that book, The Late Great Planet Earth. It appeared back in the 70s, and you talk about hundreds of millions of copies of that have circulated uh, since the time that it was released. And there's a whole lot of folks out there who've read that and believe the false doctrines in it. Lindsay says, quote, there's no evidence 
that the church was revealed anywhere in the Old Testament. And yet what does Romans 1 and verse 2 declare? The gospel was promised beforehand through the prophets. And that gospel would include the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, did Paul preach the church? In Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, he makes clear that the church was a part of God's plan. Now, this chart here is a little different from the first one that I showed you in the following area. I want to show you this. Right in this section right here, you'll notice that it says between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel 9, which we will talk about this week and explain. It's not nearly as complicated as some folks would try to make it out to be, but the prophet Daniel depicted something that, some things that would happen within a 70-week time period, but he was not speaking of 70 literal weeks uh, because those days have come and gone, and uh, those days came and went before the church even actually got here as far as literal time periods are concerned. And so here's what I want you to notice. They say Israel was the physical kingdom, and that Christ came the first time, was rejected, and thus had to go to the cross, and that he ascended, and then the Holy Spirit descended, and the church age began. In fact, they say the book of Revelation starts with the letters to the churches because that is God's way of saying, okay, this is the church age, but after the church age, Revelation 3, starting in Revelation 4, and going through Revelation chapter 19, they say that is... Uh, different. That's a different time frame. That's the seven years of great tribulation is what they believe. That when you start reading Revelation 4 and you get to Revelation 19, all of that they say is about seven years of great tribulation they claim are coming. And they ignore the context of the book of Revelation as it relates to the actual uh, residents of the churches of Asia. Now this chart right here manifests this. They say Antichrist, and we'll have a discussion about him as well. Uh, is there one singular figure that's coming that's going to be known as Antichrist? Or were there a number of those against Christ in John's day? And aren't there some folks today in multiple numbers, not just one singular figure, who are anti or against Christ and that we shouldn't be looking for one particular man. But premillennialism says, oh no, there's, there's someone coming. He might already be here and he's going to be so magnetic in his personality. Everyone will adore him, trust him, believe in him. And then he's going to get everyone's trust and then turn on the Christians and really start persecuting them and it's going to be a horrible, horrible seven years of tribulation on earth when this Antichrist is ruling and reigning. And that's when Christ will take the raptured saints that he brought to heaven with him. And he'll come back to this earth and he'll fight the uh, battle of Armageddon and indeed set up an earthly kingdom. And Satan will then near the end of time be released and then there'll be another battle and we'll have the final judgment day. So that's the big picture. And it's convoluted and complicated, and it doesn't need to be what you and I believe about the end times. Now, all I want to do for the rest of this first class is ask this question and answer it. Will Jesus establish an earthly kingdom at the end of time? And the way I'm going to address this is, well, if he's already established that kingdom, then there's no need for him to establish it at the end of time. Does the Bible ever say that God planned to establish a kingdom in the Old Testament? Yes. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David receives a visit from a prophet named Nathan. Now what's fascinating here is that Nathan originally, when David told him, you know what, Nathan... I want to build God a temple. And Nathan said, without even waiting for a word from God about it, Nathan said, it sounds like a great idea. I think you ought to do it. And God gets a hold of Nathan in 2 Samuel 7 in those first few verses. And he says, Nathan, I didn't tell you to tell David 
to build me a temple. David's not going to build me a temple. One of his descendants is going to build me a temple. And in fact, one of his ultimate descendants will build me the greatest temple, a greater one than Solomon's going to build. And so this is the anticipation. But uh, Nathan has to go back to David and say, okay, change in plans from what I told you about you building this. He says, really, you're going to die first. When your days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, someone that comes from you physically, and I'll establish his kingdom. And notice, he shall build an house for my name. Would you please zoom in on that phrase, he shall build a house for my name and file it away. Remember, their claim is the church was never anticipated by the Old Testament prophets. Well, let's see about that. He shall build an house for my name. I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, we know this can't be fulfilled completely by Solomon because Solomon didn't stay on his throne forever. He left that throne and someone else took his place. And uh, yet Jesus Christ would someday come and occupy the throne and never be replaced by anyone while that kingdom was in existence on earth. Now, I want you to notice this, if you will, please. God had a plan to build a house that's somewhat like a, a Polaroid picture. And I know most folks know the Polaroids. The younger folks, if they're in here this morning, may be saying, I've only heard of that legend. I didn't know it actually really existed. Yes, you take a picture and you wait and you watch as the picture unfolds and develops right before your very eyes. It wasn't like the phones of our day and time where you take the picture and immediately get the result right before your very eyes. And the Old Testament is in many ways like a slowly developing Polaroid of God's plan to bring the church, the kingdom, the house into existence. Now remember this phrase that we just saw. He says... He shall build a house, verse 13, for my name. Now, does Isaiah ever talk about a house? Watch this, Isaiah 2 and verse 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and who's invited to become a part of this household? All nations shall flow unto it. Isaiah, you're giving us even more detailed information than we got in 2 Samuel 7. The picture's developing further. We now know that this house is going to be the Lord's house and that it's going to be established in the last days. Where? In Jerusalem. Okay, that raises a question. Who's invited to be a part of it? All nations. And how would they know about this? Watch verse 3 of Isaiah 2. Many people shall go and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. And I haven't read this phrase, to the house of the God of Jacob. Now, please notice that phrase and keep it in your mind. To the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us of his ways, we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from where? From Jerusalem. So, when we get to the New Testament, Mary is informed by the angel in Luke chapter 1 that she's going to conceive and bring forth a son, call his name Jesus, he shall be great, he'll be called the son of the highest, and this phrase right here should really be focused upon, the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, David. When you're dead and buried, one of your descendants will establish a kingdom, build me a house. You'll be dead and gone when this happens, but it's someone that will proceed from your line, your physical lineage. And sure enough, here is Mary being told Jesus is the son of David. He is going to, in fact, be given the throne of his father David. Now, what does a throne represent? A king. And what does a king have? A kingdom. 
And so he's going to reign over the, remember that phrase we put in red just a moment ago, the house of the God of Jacob would be established in the last days in Jerusalem. And what do we see here? We see that this descendant of David would reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now there's something we call a parallelism and you see it very vividly in this last phrase in red, these last two phrases that are in red. The phrase forever has something that equals it in the next phrase there shall be no end. So forever and there shall be no end are equivalent. Now there's something else here that's equivalent then. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. His kingdom and the house of Jacob are also equivalent. They match up. And so why is that significant? Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, after he'd asked, well, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? They say you're John the Baptist or one of the prophets and Jeremiah or someone. Well, whom do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. This statement is made by Jesus in response to Peter's declaration. Thou art Peter. Upon this rock, this bedrock of truth that you've just confessed about who I am, that solid foundation is the foundation upon which I will build, David, he shall build a house for that. One of your descendants, when you're dead and buried, is going to build something. Jesus, are you a descendant of David? Yes. Are you going to build anything? I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, he said, won't stop me from doing that. And then verse 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. He shall establish a kingdom, David. He shall build a house. I will build my church and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. I know that some folks have wanted to debate whether the church and the kingdom are the same thing. But I want you to stop and think about something with me. Just reason with me for a moment. Would it make sense for Jesus to say, I'm going to build something and give you the keys to something else that I'm not even talking about right now? Or would it make more sense for Jesus to say, I'm going to build something and I'm going to give you the keys to it? You say, well, he's building the church but giving him the keys to the kingdom. That's like me saying, I'm going to build a house and I'll give you the keys to the domicile where we live. And I'm referring to the very house that we're going to live in. I'm just using a different term to describe the same thing. And that's what's going on here. Now, if you don't believe this connects, watch this beautiful harmony here. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have Jesus saying, I will build my church. But remember, David was told one of your descendants will build a house. Is this the same thing? On this side of the screen, you see 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul tells Timothy, I want you to know how you ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is what? Which is the church of the living God. The Bible comes right out and says it. The house of God is the church. So what does this tell us? He'll build a house for you. Well, the house is the church. He'll build a church. He'll build a kingdom, establish it. Yes, one of your descendants, David, after you're dead and buried, is going to build you a house and establish a kingdom. Mark it down, it's going to happen. Now, when would this happen? God had a plan as to when this would come into existence. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever built your own homes, but... Uh, I know this, you don't just get up one day and just go out on the same day that you think about building a house and start building. It takes some planning ahead of time. We've got to get the piece of land, or if we have the piece of land, we've got to clear it or lay the foundation. We've got to gather the materials. We've got to then start building after some work has been done of preparatory nature. Same way with the church. It was prepared for, predicted, anticipated, and then it was finally presented. 
As you see, Mark 9, 1, it's very clear. Jesus says, some of them standing here during the time Jesus was alive, he said, some of the folks standing here listening to me preach right now, not me, B.J. Clark, but Jesus the Christ, some of the very folks listening to him preach, he said, shall not taste of death till they, the people who are listening to Jesus preach, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, your premillennial friends and mine make this claim. The second coming of Christ is pre, before the millennium. That's why we call it pre-millennialism. Pre meaning before, millennial meaning thousand. And they say the second coming of Christ is before a thousand year reign on earth. But uh, what's interesting about this premillennial idea, they claim the kingdom hasn't arrived yet. Jesus said to some of the people of his day, you'll be alive when, you, when it comes. You'll see it. Now, if the kingdom has not yet come, you know what that means if Jesus told the truth? If Jesus told the truth, some of the people that heard him speak in Mark 9-1 are still alive on the planet today, walking around nearly 2,000 years old. If the kingdom has not yet come and Jesus told the truth, you'd have to have some 2,000-year-old people approximately walking around on the planet that would make Methuselah look like a little baby. My friends, there's another solution. There's only one correct solution to this, and that's not to have 2,000-year-old people on the earth so Jesus can be telling the truth. It's to admit that, wait a minute, that kingdom has already come. Look at the other side of the chart here, Luke 24, 49. I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now, why would Jesus tell his apostles to stay in the city of Jerusalem? It makes perfect sense. He says, I want you to stay in the city of Jerusalem. Why? Until you be endued with power. Wait, the kingdom is going to come with power and the power is going to come from on high. I want you to stay in Jerusalem. Well, wait, Isaiah said that's where the word of the Lord would first go forth, from Jerusalem. I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to stay there until the power comes from on high. All right, that's simple enough. And then we see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, when would this power be dispensed? He tells them, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. The kingdom will come with power. The power will come when the Spirit comes. And you'll be where? You'll be witnesses unto me. Where does this start? In Jerusalem. That's where it's all going to start. And then it will spread to Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, but it's all going to start in Jerusalem. So is there ever a time when we can find the apostles in Jerusalem with David dead and buried, waiting for the coming of the kingdom in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, the day of Pentecost has fully arrived, and they were all with one accord in one place, and that points back to the apostles of Acts one twenty six. And they, the apostles, were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now when would the power come? After the Holy Spirit's come upon you, apostles. Did the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles in Acts 2? Yes. Would the kingdom come with power? Yes. When did the power come? Acts 2. So we would expect to find the kingdom established in Acts chapter 2. Now Isaiah said there would be some that uh, would be in Jerusalem and that the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. Where are we in Acts 2, 5? There were dwelling at Jerusalem. We're in the right place in Acts chapter 2. Notice, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Isaiah, what did you say? All nations shall flow unto it, this household. And in Acts 2, 5, we've got men out of every nation under heaven represented. And the Bible goes on to say, remember something else Isaiah said? This would all happen when, Isaiah? In the last days. Now, a lot of people today, when they hear the phrase last days, they think that can't be something that's already happened because there have been so many days since then. But it's, it depends on what last days you're talking about. 
We're in the last age of Bible history right now. There will never be another age of Bible history that will take place on the earth after this one. When the Lord comes back, this age ceases and we go into the eternal age. But we're presently in the Christian age and these last days occurred and Isaiah chapter 2 says that in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house would be established and sure enough, would you look at Acts chapter 2, what does Peter say? Even though he's quoting Joel, Joel said something would also happen in the last days. He's quoting Joel, but he admits something. What was happening on Pentecost was happening in the last days. That's what the Bible says. So, put this all together and here's what you have. David, when your days are fulfilled and you sleep with your fathers... I'm going to set up your seed after thee, and I'm going to establish his kingdom. He's going to build a house for me. Now, do you find it a little bit interesting that in Acts 2.29, Peter would say the following, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried. His sepulchre is with us to this day. Is that breaking news? Oh, by the way, in case you hadn't heard, David died. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you know that? Did you know David died? I didn't know that. They knew. He'd been dead almost a thousand years. So can you tell me why Peter would be making such a big deal out of the fact that David was dead and buried? Here's why. There was a prophecy connected to that. When thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers... That's when I'm going to set up your seed after thee and I'll establish his kingdom. And sure enough, in Acts 2.29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried. His sepulchre's with us to this day. And that's exactly what the Bible says. David was dead and buried. And so, remember what would happen? The kingdom would be established. That would be the house of God, the church. Now, do you ever see... Do you ever see in Acts chapter 2 the church being recognized and as now being in existence? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved, such as were being saved. Now, I want to show you this. If you go to your Bible in Acts 2 for just a moment and zoom in on verse number 29, Actually, verse 30, right after Peter says, hey, you remember David's dead and buried. Well, sure, we know that. What, what's the significance of bringing that up right now? Here's the significance, verse 30 of Acts 2. Therefore, in view of the fact that David is dead and buried, therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ, not Solomon, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, the throne of his father David. He seen this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul wasn't left in hell, his flesh didn't see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, he says we're all witnesses of it, and therefore watch. Someday the Lord will come back and establish a kingdom on earth and know. Being right now, by the right hand of God, exalted, and watch this phrase, Acts 2.33, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he shed forth this which you now see and hear. And David's not ascended into the heavens. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made, not will make someday when he gets another chance to try to set up his kingdom then. No, God has made the same Jesus you crucified, both Lord and Christos, anointed one, king. He's already a king of his kingdom because the kingdom has already been established. The Bible makes it clear. What happened in Acts chapter 2? is what Isaiah chapter 2 had always anticipated in the latter days. The Lord's house would be established 
And oftentimes mountains were used to refer to kingdoms in the uh, language of Scripture. A mountain would be used sometimes to refer as a synonym for a kingdom. But what mountain is superior to all the other mountains? Well, we don't have time to look at this in detail, but you will remember that Daniel had uh, interpreted a dream for Nebuchadnezzar in which the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire all came tumbling down, came crumbling down. But there would be a kingdom established in the future that would never be destroyed, Daniel 2.44. And that kingdom has already been established during the days of the Roman kings, John the baptizer was going around saying, the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's almost here, it's almost here, it's almost here. And you know, Jesus said that the kingdom is at hand, Mark 1, 15. He said, the kingdom of God is nigh unto you. It's this close in Luke chapter 10 and verse 9. Were Jesus and John wrong? I want to close out by noticing with you this. In John 6, 15, Jesus perceived they were about to take him by force and make him a king. Now, if you came to be an earthly king, wouldn't this be your moment of opportunity? What does the Bible say he did? He withdrew himself. He did not accept this offer. Now, if this idea is true, that Jesus Christ came to be an earthly king. This should have been his moment of acceptance of that mission. In fact, I would ask who rejected whom. The idea is, well, they unexpectedly rejected Christ and so he couldn't set up his kingdom. No, he unexpectedly to them rejected their offer to make him an earthly king. And he said, I am not interested. Remember John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. And so I'm not looking forward to any earthly kingdom. I'm looking forward to going to the heavenly kingdom. And as we continue to go through this study, I hope that you will be able to see that we're privileged right now to be born again and added members of the kingdom of heaven and to look forward to a time when we can live there forever and not have to live here forever.